Hey guys, what's up? It's Savannah. Welcome back to my channel and welcome back to another true crime episode here on my YouTube channel. As you guys can tell by the title of today's video, today we are talking about the case of Jeffrey Epstein. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard the name Jeffrey Epstein before. And if you haven't, we're going to be talking all about him today. I have partnered with ID for their nine nights of true crime specials called Nine at Nine. So it starts on Memorial Day, which is May 25th at 9 p.m. Eastern time. And there will be an entire special dedicated to the case of Jeffrey Epstein, which will be airing on Sunday, May 31st at 9 p.m. Eastern time as well. I'm gonna be live tweeting throughout the entire special, and I'm also gonna be going on Instagram live once the special is over to discuss all your guys' thoughts on the case. So make sure you tune into that special. I'm gonna have all the information linked in the description box below for you to check out as well. And with that being said, let's move on to the rest of the case. So let's dig in to who Jeffrey Epstein was and why we are talking about him today. Jeffrey Epstein was an extremely powerful man who worked as a financier in New York City, and he had connections to many powerful and wealthy people, including celebrities. In July of 2019, Jeffrey was arrested for sex trafficking minors, and while awaiting his trial, he actually died from what has become a very, very controversial death. But that doesn't even begin to scratch the surface of the corruptness in this case. This case has so many different pieces and layers to it, and the story in and of itself is extremely shocking and disturbing, which is why I wanted to share it with you guys today. I feel like I had always heard about Jeffrey Epstein and knew the brief and vague story, but it wasn't until I did my recent research on this case that I was completely blown away by it all. And I know that this isn't the typical case that we would usually cover on my channel, but because it involves such a heinous crime with such a high profile person, I thought it would be a very interesting case to cover. So Jeffrey Epstein was born on January 20th, 1953, in Brooklyn, New York to his parents, Pauline and Seymour Epstein. Pauline worked as a teacher's assistant and Seymour worked as a gardener and a landscaper for the New York City Department of Parks and Recreations. Jeffrey was one of two boys in his family. He had a younger brother named Mark and him and his family lived in the Seagate neighborhood of Coney Island, Brooklyn. So something about Jeffrey is he was extremely, extremely intelligent. So intelligent that he actually ended up skipping two grades of school. So he ended up graduating high school at the age of 16 years old. At 16 years old, he graduated from Brooklyn's Lafayette High School. And after graduating high school at 16, he attended the Cooper Union School for the Advancement in Science and Art in 1971. And this school is also just known as Cooper Union. And Cooper Union is located in Manhattan, New York. So Jeffrey did stay pretty local in the New York City area. And then shortly after in the same year, he ended up attending the Corrent Institute of Mathematical Sciences at NYU. Jeffrey attended NYU for about three years before leaving without graduating in June of 1974. A couple months after leaving NYU, Jeffrey became a teacher at the Dalton School. The Dalton School is located on the Upper East Side of New York and it is an elite private college preparatory school. It's fairly big. It's located in four different buildings. So Jeffrey started working there in September, but a little less than two years later in June of 1976, Jeffrey actually ended up getting fired from the Dalton School for poor performance. Now what's interesting here is that prior to Jeffrey leaving the Dalton School, he actually made a very valuable connection to one of his students' parents, and that was a man named Alan Greenberg. Alan Greenberg was the chairman of an investment banking company called Bear Stearns at the time. So Alan thought that Jeffrey was really smart with money and with numbers. So because of that, Alan actually gave Jeffrey a job working as an assistant at Bear Stearns in 1976. Even though Jeffrey's job at Bear Stearns just started out as being an assistant to a floor trader, Jeffrey ended up quickly gaining leverage and status in the company. And eventually he started advising some of the company's wealthiest clients. So about six years into working for Bear Stearns, Jeffrey actually ended up leaving the company. And it was later thought that the reason Jeffrey left was because of some sort of violation. But either way, following his departure from Bear Stearns, he actually founded his own consulting firm. This consulting firm was called the Intercontinental Assets Group Inc., otherwise known as IAG, and it was founded in 1982. So if you are unfamiliar with what a consulting firm is, because I definitely 
family was at the time as well. A consulting firm is a business that is built of industry specific experts who give their advice and guidance to businesses who need it. And even though Jeffrey had moved on from Bear Stearns to IAG, he still did remain pretty close with Alan Greenberg, as well as the CEO of Bear Stearns, which was a man named Jimmy Kane, up until Bear Stearns ended up going bankrupt in 2008. So some of Jeffrey's clients at IAG included a Saudi Arabian businessman named Adnan Khashoggi. Adnan's net worth was about $4 billion in the 1980s. And then in 1987, Jeffrey actually met a man named Stephen Hoffenberg. Stephen Hoffenberg was a former chairman of a company called the Tower Financial Corporation. And Stephen hired Jeffrey in 1987 and started paying him $25,000 a month, which to give you some context is equivalent to about $56,000 thousand dollars a month in today's terms and Jeffrey was being paid for his consulting work but then in 1993 Tower Financial Corporation actually blew up as one of the biggest Ponzi schemes and if you are unfamiliar with what a Ponzi scheme is it is essentially when there is a schemer or a fraud in a business and for example if they were to say I can make you a bunch of money really fast if you give me a hundred dollars if you invest a hundred dollars in me I can give you a hundred and twenty dollars in about a month because the the more money you invest in us, the more money I can give back to you, essentially. But the trick here is that instead of taking the money that's being invested in them and earning more of it, a Ponzi scheme is essentially stealing the money that investors give to a schemer. Once the Ponzi scheme gets too many investors involved, it typically always ends up blowing up and it doesn't work anymore because the investors will expect more and more money to be given back to them and they will grow impatient and the schemer also needs to try and save some money for themselves as well. And the scheme will eventually have no money to give and that is exactly what happened here. So because of the Ponzi scheme of Tower Financial, the investors of the company actually ended up losing about $450 million, which again to put it in today's terms is equivalent to about $796 million. Now Stephen Hoffenberg, the man who hired Jeffrey, claimed that not only was Jeffrey involved in the Ponzi scheme but that he was behind the entire thing. However, this actually never ended up affecting Jeffrey because because Jeffrey ended up leaving Tower Financial Corporation in 1989, which was years prior to this Ponzi scheme ever coming to light. So he was never charged for allegedly being involved in this. So after leaving Tower Financial Corporation, Jeffrey ended up starting his own financial management firm in 1989 that was called J. Epstein and Co. So this was an extremely elite company that had very high qualifications in order to be taken on by them as a client. And one of these qualifications is that the client would have to have a net worth of about a billion dollars to be taken on by J. Epstein and Co. So because of the fact that Jeffrey only accepted elite billionaires as his clientele, pretty much his entire clientele list has never been released to the public. The only publicly known client that Jeffrey has ever had from J. Epstein and Co. is a man named Leslie Wexner. So if you've never heard of Leslie Wexner, he's actually the founder of L Brands and Victoria's Secret. And to give you a little bit more context, Leslie Wexner's net worth is about $4.1 billion. Jeffrey and Leslie met in 1986 through some mutual friends that the two of them shared. And about a year after meeting is when Leslie hired Jeffrey to be his financial advisor. After about a year of being his financial advisor, Leslie then granted Jeffrey full power of attorney over Leslie's affairs. So with full power of attorney, this basically meant that Jeffrey had the power to hire and fire people from Leslie's companies. He also had the power to sign Leslie's checks for him. He had the power to buy and sell Leslie's properties. He had the power to borrow money from Leslie and literally do anything else under a legally binding nature. And then in 1995, Jeffrey was also promoted to being a director of the Wexner Foundation and of the Wexner Heritage Foundation. Jeffrey made millions of dollars from handling Leslie's financial affairs. And with being Leslie's right-hand man, it also gave Jeffrey full access to Victoria's Secret fashion shows. He would also try and help aspiring young models work for Victoria's Secret, and he was also known to host models at his home. In 1996, Jeffrey actually changed the name of J. Epstein & Co. to the Financial Trust Company, and Jeffrey also based this company out of the Virgin Islands for tax purposes. Jeffrey was actually able to reduce his federal income tax by 90% by just basing it out of the U.S. Virgin Islands. 
So now we move in to the early 2000s, and in the early 2000s, Jeffrey continued to grow his business. He did this by working with multiple financing media companies, developing securities, as well as funding and investing in different hedge funds. And he also started his own nonprofit foundation created to donate millions of dollars to multiple different institutions, including Harvard University. So I know that might have felt like a drag to go through for some of you, but I think it is so important to understand the backstory of this case, just like in any case that we cover. It's also important because Jeffrey Epstein's wealth has actually been a huge center of controversy over the years, in the sense that no one really understands how Jeffrey himself was able to gain so much wealth. There have been multiple theories thrown out there as to how Jeffrey gained so much money. However, to this day, it is not really clear. So with all of that being said, it's very clear that Jeffrey did have some power in the business world. And because of that, he was also linked to some very powerful and famous people as well. This included former President Bill Clinton, it also included Kevin Spacey, President Donald Trump, Prince Andrew, Woody Allen, and a bunch more. So the reason I'm telling you this is because I want you to understand not just the amount of power that Jeffrey had, but also the amount of power that the people he associated himself with had as well. So when Jeffrey opened up J. Epstein and Co. in the Virgin Islands, he also ended up purchasing his own island. Now this was a 72 acre island called Little St. James and Jeffrey purchased Little St. James for about 7.95 million dollars. Now to this day no one really knows other than the people who have physically been to the island what the inside of that island really looks like. There have been reports from former employees who have come out and said that in the main residence which is where Jeffrey would reside there were two offices in that residence that no one was was allowed into except the maid that worked for Jeffrey. It is said that in these offices, Jeffrey kept security boxes. To this day, what's in those security boxes has never been released to the public. A contractor who actually worked for Jeffrey on the island did come forward and said that all throughout the buildings on the island, there are multiple suggestive photos of topless women as well as fully nude photographs. There was also something else on Jeffrey's island that was very bizarre and that has raised a lot of questions. And that was a temple that Jeffrey had on his island. To this day, no one is really sure what this temple was used for. Some people have thought that it could be used as a practice room for Jeffrey to play piano since he was classically trained in playing piano. Some people have said that it's probably just a gym, like an exercise room to have on the island. But there is something interesting about this temple and that is, is that when you look at the door of the temple, there is actually a wooden bar that hangs off the outside Side of the temple. Now this wooden bar has brought up a lot of speculation as to if people were being kept inside of this temple. Because if you think about it, to give you a picture, if you imagine a hotel room and on a hotel room door, you have the regular lock that's on the doorknob and then you have the bar lock that you put on as well, sometimes for extra security. The reason that the bar lock is on the inside of the room is that so no one can enter from the outside of the door. However, when you have a bar lock on the outside of the door, it seems like your intention would be to lock someone or something inside of the room, if that makes sense. So that has always been up for speculation as well. So with that all being said, let's move on to talking about Jeffrey Epstein's sex trafficking ring. So before we do that, there are multiple people that we need to mention in order for you to understand kind of like a who's who in this scenario. So this is Ghislaine Maxwell. Now Ghislaine Maxwell is not only Jeffrey Epstein's ex-girlfriend, but she is also accused of being a recruiter for Jeffrey in the sex trafficking ring. Ghislaine is a British socialite and when she came to the United States that is when her and Jeffrey really hit things off and once this whole sex trafficking ring came into play, Ghislaine allegedly played a huge role in recruiting underage girls. According to different reports, Ghislaine would scope out these girls, she would approach them, ask them questions about themselves, emotionally groom them, and would tell these girls about Jeffrey and how he was this great guy who could help them in whatever Whatever they wanted, whether that was career or financial or really anything. Victims have alleged that Ghislaine would then bring these girls back to Jeffrey. That way he could use them for himself or for a lack of a better term, hand them off to his high profile friends to sexually assault and rape. To be clear, Ghislaine has been named as a defendant in civil suits related to Jeffrey Epstein's sex trafficking activities, but she has never been charged in connection of any of these incidents 
evidence and also denies any involvement. Ghislaine is actually suing Jeffrey Epstein's estate for the legal fees that she has amassed to defend herself. So the next person we need to talk about is a man named Jean-Luc Brunel. Jean-Luc Brunel is a French modeling agent and scout and him and Jeffrey met in the early 2000s. It has been alleged that Jean-Luc would send the girls that he was scouting to model, girls that were as young as 12 years old, to Jeffrey. A survivor of the ring, a woman named Virginia Goufrey, has claimed that Jeffrey told her that he had slept with over a thousand of the young girls that Jean-Luc had sent to him. Jean-Luc had allegedly lured young underage girls in by offering them modeling careers, telling them that he could make them incredibly successful, and once he was able to lure them in, he would allegedly give those girls to his friends for sexual purposes. And one of those friends was allegedly Jeffrey Epstein. When Jeffrey was arrested, Jean-Luc came forward and denied any involvement directly or indirectly in Jeffrey's crimes. It was reported that Jeffrey had invested up to a million dollars in Jean-Luc's modeling agency when it was first being launched. However, Jean-Luc again has denied any of those allegations. In 2015, Jean-Luc Brunel sued Jeffrey Epstein, claiming that Jean-Luc's business had lost millions of dollars due to the publicity of Jeffrey's crimes. And to be clear again, Jean-Luc has never been charged in any involvement related to Jeffrey's sex trafficking ring. So how did this ring operate is the next question. From what we know, Jeffrey would have his recruiters go out and find young underage girls. When it came to Jeffrey and his own sexual assaults and rapes, the most common story among the survivors is that Jeffrey did have a massage room in his house. And when the young girls would be brought to him by the recruiters, they would be brought into the massage room and would be told to give Jeffrey a massage. And that would lead to the young girls being sexually assaulted or raped. Jeffrey has been accused of having an addiction to underage girls. So everywhere he went, whether that was Paris or his island or anywhere in the United States or anywhere in the world, he would have his recruiters find young girls that would wait for Jeffrey and be there for him when he landed. Britain's Prince Andrew has been among those being accused of being involved in Jeffrey's sex trafficking ring. That same survivor, Virginia, that we just talked about has come forward and said that she was trafficked to Prince Andrew on three different occasions. She has said that her experiences in the sex trafficking ring originally just started out with Jeffrey. However, over time, she alleges that she was then assaulted by Prince Andrew. Prince Andrew and Jeffrey had actually met through Ghislaine and the two had become very close. They vacationed together and Prince Andrew traveled on Jeffrey's private jet on multiple different occasions. Virginia has said that when she would be trafficked off to Prince Andrew, Jeffrey would always tell her to come back with potential blackmail material that Jeffrey could use against him. And this was not an uncommon thing for Jeffrey. It's been alleged that Jeffrey wanted blackmail material on everyone and anyone that he could. However, regardless of these claims, Prince Andrew has vigorously denied ever meeting Virginia Goofrey and has also described any allegations of underage sex as being, quote, categorically untrue, end quote. Other men that have been accused of being involved in Jeffrey's sex trafficking ring are Marvin Minsky, who was an extremely wealthy scientist, George Mitchell, who was a former U.S. attorney and was also a Democratic Senate majority leader and a special advisor to Bill Clinton. And former President Bill Clinton was also accused of being involved in the sex ring. George Mitchell has also come forward and said that he has never met the alleged victim. Along with that, he states that he had no knowledge of Jeffrey Epstein's crimes, and he claims that he severed ties with Jeffrey after allegations against Jeffrey initially surfaced in Florida. Bill Clinton has also denounced Jeffrey's, quote, terrible crimes, end quote, and has been adamant on the fact that he has never visited Jeffrey's private island or any of his residences besides his New York residence in 2002, only one time with his security team present. Bill Clinton's representatives have stated that Bill Clinton hasn't seen Jeffrey Epstein in over a decade. Despite this, a survivor of Jeffrey Epstein claims that she did see Bill Clinton on the Little St. James Island. Donald Trump is also someone who has been linked to Jeffrey Epstein in the past. In 2002, Donald Trump did an interview where he said, quote, I've known Jeff for 15 years. Terrific guy. He's a lot of fun to be with. It is even said that he likes beautiful women as much as I do, and many of them are on the younger side, end quote. Donald Trump and Jeffrey Epstein have been photographed multiple times in Palm Beach, Florida, which is where one of Jeffrey's homes is located. In 
2016, there was actually an anonymous accuser who came forward and tried to sue Donald Trump by stating that he raped her at a party that Jeffrey Epstein was having at his home in Manhattan, New York in 1994, when she was only 13 years old. But this lawsuit was eventually dropped and Donald Trump has denied these allegations and has since said that he was, quote, not a fan, end quote, of Jeffrey Epstein. And Trump also claims that he actually kicked Jeffrey Epstein out of a party that was happening at Donald Trump's home. So now after talking about some of the alleged perpetrators in this case, I do want to move on and talk about the survivors. I do want to say that this is just a list of some of the survivors that have come forward. There have been multiple Jane Doe's who have wished to remain anonymous as well. Courtney Wilde met Jeffrey at a time in her life where she said that she was craving stability after suffering from family problems. Jeffrey saw her vulnerability and he preyed on it. Courtney said, quote, Jeffrey preyed on girls who were in a really bad way, girls who were basically homeless. He went after girls who he thought no one would listen to and he was right end quote. Michelle Licata met Jeffrey when she was 16 years old and a sophomore in high school and she was brought back to his home in Palm Beach. Jenna Lisa Jones had her first encounter with Jeffrey when she was 14 years old and she was paid $200 to give him a massage and during the massage he told her to remove her clothing. Virginia Roberts Goofrey met Jeffrey at a bar she was working at called Mar-a-Lago in Palm Springs and was recruited allegedly by Ghislaine Maxwell to be a masseuse for Jeffrey. Virginia said quote, I went from an abusive situation to being a runaway to living in foster homes. Virginia settled a lawsuit against Jeffrey in 2009 and Virginia said that she was forced to have sex with Jeffrey and was also given out to his friends to have sex with as well. Sarah Ransom met Jeffrey when she was 22 years old and even though she wasn't a minor, she was flown out to Jeffrey's island and forced to have sex with him and his other friends that were brought along. Sarah also settled a lawsuit with Jeffrey and Ghislaine. Maria Farmer met Jeffrey when she was 26 years old and the following year she claims that both Jeffrey and Ghislaine sexually assaulted her as well as assaulted her underage sister Annie Farmer at Jeffrey's New Mexico ranch. Maria did go to the police who then told her to go to the FBI and it's reported that Maria was the first person to report Jeffrey to the police. Jennifer Oreos met Jeffrey when she was 14 years old after she was recruited by a woman outside of her high school in New York City and was told about Jeffrey and how he could help her in her career as an aspiring Broadway star. For the following year, Jennifer went to Jeffrey's home once or twice a week where she was sexually assaulted and eventually raped. Again, those are just some of the stories of the women who have come forward. So then in March of 2005, there was actually a 14-year-old girl who came forward and told her parents that she had been taken to Jeffrey Epstein's home by one of his recruiters and was given $300 to strip her clothing for him, as well as massage him. Now when this happened, this 14 year old girl's stepmother contacted Palm Beach Police Department in Florida. The police then contacted the FBI and that is when a 13 month investigation on Jeffrey Epstein had started. The police interviewed five alleged victims of Jeffrey as well as 17 potential witnesses. When police searched through Jeffrey's homes, they found a high school transcript as well as multiple other pieces of evidence proving that there had been underage girls in his home. Police also found multiple multiple suggestive photos of underage girls lying around the house as well as hidden cameras everywhere. So throughout this 13 month investigation, the FBI was actually able to compile reports from 34 confirmed minors who had given the authorities details about the sexual abuse that they endured while being with Jeffrey Epstein. In May of 2006, the Palm Beach Police Department had actually filed a probable cause statement stating that Jeffrey Epstein was going to be charged with one one count of sexual abuse, as well as multiple accounts of sex with minors. So this ended up going to a grand jury, and that is when Jeffrey Epstein got a felony charge. It was one felony charge of solicitation of prostitution, which Jeffrey entered a not guilty plea for. Now the Palm Beach Police Department thought that with the severity of Jeffrey's crimes, the punishment that he was receiving was way too lenient. And that is when the Palm Beach Police Department pushed for the FBI to get involved, which is exactly Exactly what ended up happening. So the FBI launched their own independent investigation and they called it Operation Leap Year. In June 2008, following a plea deal, Jeffrey Epstein was charged with a lesser charge of solicitation of prostitution involving a minor. Jeffrey pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 18 months in prison as well as it was required for him to register as a sex offender. So 
the plea deal allowed Jeffrey to only serve 18 months in prison, but it also basically shut down the entire investigation that the FBI was continuing to see if there were any more victims or any more people of power who took part in Jeffrey's sex ring. This included thousands of emails, court documents, and other records. But Jeffrey actually didn't end up serving the 18 months. Jeffrey actually got released from prison after serving only 13 months. And people were very, very upset about this. They thought that with the amount of evidence that had been brought forward by so many victims, as well as the severity of what the authorities were finding on him, that a 13 month sentence was absolutely unacceptable. And even though Jeffrey had to register as a sex offender with the New York Police Department, which required him to check in with the NYPD every 90 days to confirm his address, Jeffrey actually never checked in with the NYPD, not even one time. So Jeffrey was clearly finding loopholes and just breaking rules left and right. A longtime survivor of Jeffrey actually said that they were convinced that Jeffrey was going to be getting away with this for forever, that he was going to get away with everything that he was doing and that no one was going to believe the survivor when they shared their stories of the abuse that they were enduring. The retired Palm Beach police chief actually came out and said, and I'm gonna look over here so I can read the quote directly. He said, quote, this was not a he said, she said situation. This was a 50 something she's and one he. And all of the she's basically told the same story, end quote. And this was in reference to all of the victims who had accused Jeffrey and Jeffrey being referred to as the one he in this situation. Detectives were really shocked with the amount of young girls that were coming forward who had been coming and going from Jeffrey's homes all day, every day. And no one ever thought that there was anything off putting about it. However, in November of 2018, the Miami Herald actually published a news article, which is extremely interesting by the way. I'm going to try and link it in the description box below for you to check out. But when this article was published, it was basically going over Jeffrey's history of the sexual abuse allegations. And this basically started the fire all over again for people who wanted justice for all of Jeffrey's victims. And that justice was eventually served. On July 6th, 2019, Jeffrey Epstein was arrested and charged with several counts of sex trafficking, as well as conspiracy to commit sex trafficking. Jeffrey pleaded not guilty to these charges, but was facing about 45 years in prison if he was found guilty. And to give you some context, Jeffrey was 66 years old when he was arrested. So if he had been found guilty, he was going to be spending the rest of his life in prison. The FBI and authorities had raided Jeffrey's homes with search warrants and again found countless suggestive photos of underage girls. Authorities had also looked in Jeffrey's safe that was kept in his home. And not only did they find more suggestive pictures, but they also found $70,000 in cash as well as 48 diamonds. There was also a fraudulent Austrian passport that had expired in 1987. On July 8th, 2019, prosecutors charged Jeffrey with sex trafficking and conspiracy to traffic minors for sex. The grand jury indictment alleged that dozens of underage girls were brought to Jeffrey's home for sexual encounters. Jeffrey was being held with no bond and was awaiting a trial date. However, on July 23rd, 2019, Jeffrey had actually been found injured in his jail cell at about 1.30 in the morning. He was found on the floor of his jail cell with marks around his neck, similar to those that would resemble a suicide attempt. Jeffrey's cellmate at the time was actually a former NYPD officer who was being charged with four counts of murder. And he was actually questioned about having any involvement in the accident, which he adamantly denied. Jeffrey did survive this accident. And when he was able to regain consciousness, he said that he remembered absolutely nothing from the incident. So after this incident, Jeffrey was actually placed on suicide watch because again, no one was really sure what had happened. So they decided that the best thing to do was to place Jeffrey on suicide watch, which he was there for about six days before being transferred to a special housing unit. Now in the special housing unit, Jeffrey did have a cellmate and the protocol for the special housing unit was that a guard was supposed to go to Jeffrey's cell and check on him to make sure everything was all right. And this was supposed to happen every 30 minutes. Now on the night of August 9th, 2019, Jeffrey's cellmate was actually removed from the cell and there was no replacement brought in. So it was just Jeffrey all alone. And just like any other night with proper protocol, the guards were supposed to check on Jeffrey every 30 minutes to make sure he was all right. But these guards had actually fallen asleep and had failed to check on Jeffrey for about three hours. 
and then they allegedly falsified the records. And to just add one thing on top of another, the two cameras that were supposed to be facing Jeffrey's cell just so happened to not be working that night. So at about 6.30 a.m. on August 10th, 2019, the guards went to check on Jeffrey for the first time in about three hours, and that is when they found Jeffrey dead in his cell. Emergency responders were called, and Jeffrey was taken to the hospital. However, they were unsuccessful in the life-saving measures that they took on Jeffrey, and Jeffrey passed away. Jeffrey's death was ruled a suicide, and when an autopsy was conducted, it was shown that Jeffrey had multiple breaks in his neck, as well as a break in what is called the hyoid bone. Now, a break in the hyoid bone can occur when someone does hang themselves. However, it has also been found that this bone can break in homicides that happen through strangulation. On August 16th, 2019, Jeffrey's death was ruled suicide by hanging. Now, there has been a lot of controversy surrounding what exactly happened the night that Jeffrey died. There's been lots of speculation as to whether or not foul play had been involved. Jeffrey's defense attorneys were really not happy with how quickly Jeffrey's death was deemed a suicide and then kind of tossed to the side afterwards and no one really looked at it twice. The Department of Justice, Inspector General, and the FBI were both ordered by Attorney General Barr to investigate Jeffrey's death. When they did this, they found that the two guards that were supposed to be watching Jeffrey the night of his death, these guards were named Michael Thomas and Tova Noel. The investigation had found that these guards had allegedly falsified their records of when they had checked on Jeffrey to hide the fact that they hadn't performed their scheduled observation on Jeffrey. And it was revealed that the guards actually actually went eight hours without checking on Jeffrey in his cell. Now the guards have come forward and complained about the bad working conditions that they were working under and they have said that they were badly overworked the night that Jeffrey had died. The guards have also come forward and said that they have been made out to be scapegoats for Jeffrey's death when the poor working conditions at the prison are actually what's to blame here. The guards have been charged with falsifying records and the guards have never been considered suspects in Jeffrey's death. It is still unclear why the cameras that were facing Jeffrey cell were not working that night, as well as why Jeffrey's cellmate was removed from his cell and a replacement was never brought back in. That is still unclear. Now, despite the unusual circumstances surrounding Jeffrey's death, there have been multiple people who have pointed out that Jeffrey knew that there was a lot of damning evidence against him and that it was very probable that he was going to be spending the rest of his life in prison. And so he decided to end his life before that could happen. A lot of people, including law enforcement, do believe that Jeffrey did commit suicide and that the circumstances surrounding his death were just coincidences. And then you have the people that believe that there's no such thing as coincidences, especially not in this case. I think that this case is so shocking because you always hear about the darkness and the shadiness and how dirty and corrupt some of these businesses are, but to actually hear the details and to hear for how long this went on for, it's just very disturbing and mind blowing. But I am so interested to hear what you guys think as far as Jeffrey's death goes. Do you guys think that it was a suicide or do you think that there was foul play involved? Do you think that there's more to it? Do you think Jeffrey Epstein was killed? I know that this case has a lot of layers to it and there still are so many women out there who haven't come forward to share their story, which is completely understandable. It's just very sad to think about what has happened to Jeffrey's survivors. So with that being said, you guys, that is all for me today. Don't forget to join me watching ID special Who Killed Jeffrey Epstein airing on May 31st at 9 p.m. Eastern time. Again, I'll be on ID's Facebook watch party Party for the show just before it airs. So check out the link for that in the description box below. Again, I'll have all of the information you need in the description box below. So make sure you go check that out. You guys can watch with me and we will discuss it together. And with that being said, you guys, that is all for me today. Thank you so much for tuning in to another true crime video. If you're new to my channel, hi, my name is Savannah. I make videos three days a week, Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday. You should subscribe and join the family. I'll be back in a couple days with a brand new video and I will see you guys then. Bye guys.